Shamai, welcome. For a while, I've been wondering whether it's possible to use an ESP32 to build a hard Bitcoin hardware wallet. Um, when I was at the San Francisco Bitcoin conference, I bumped into um, Stepan Snigrov and I asked him whether it's possible. And he said, not only is it possible, he's actually built an Arduino, Arduino compatible library for doing such a thing. So we both got really excited, uh, particularly because I had a bunch of e-paper screens and he wanted to see if we could build that into it somehow. So we spent a couple of days hacking on it, trying to make this ESP32 hardware wallet. Um, and uh, Stefan did it, which is incredible. Um, so I'm gonna make a collection of tutorials. Um, uh, so, you know, you at home can build your own, uh, you know, under $10 or under $5, whatever, uh, Bitcoin hardware wallet using an ESP32. So in this first installation, we're gonna look at how um, modern Bitcoin hardware, well, Bitcoin hardware wallets, how they derive addresses, and we're going to build what's called a watch-only hardware wallet. So it's not going to have private keys on. It's not going to have the ability to spend funds. It's just going to have the ability to um, uh, generate new uh, addresses, so you can receive funds to a Bitcoin wallet. As always, the code for the project is on my GitHub under uh, ArcBTC, and this one's called Goomba. Um, so it's just a, a very cheap uh, watch-only Bitcoin hardware wallet. We are going to extend this, though, to make it a full Bitcoin hardware wallet in time. We've got a link there to Stepan's library, which we're going to be using, which is uh, absolutely fantastic. We're only using a small portion of the library, obviously, because it's just a watch-only wallet, this one. Um, but he explains some of the classes and functions. And in fact, he's actually got the um, uh, some really nice documentation uh, written up um, on the, on the, uh, the library itself, so very useful. Uh, and we're going to be exploring that a little bit more in future tutorials. For this tutorial, though, however, all we need to do is um, you need to download, uh, clone or download the, the GitHub. Um, so save that. And then in um, Arduino, you need to go to Tools, uh, sorry, Sketch, uh, Include Library, and then Add Zip Library. And then you navigate to uh, where the, the you saved it and then install it and then it should be installed so you can use his library uh, what other libraries are we using are we using any other libraries we need to install let's have a little look um yeah we've got a qr code we need to install so that would be i think you can just install that from include library let's have a little look manage libraries and i'm pretty sure if you just type in qr code it should come up Yep, there it is. Um, by Richard Moore, you want to install that library too. And EEP ROM, you don't need to install that. That's a ESP32 core library. Uh, core library. So we select um, all the code there. It's like 100 lines of code, just nothing. And then we plunk it in here. Bump. So before we get started on me explaining how the code works, it's, it's very simple, but in order to understand it, you're going to have to understand some. Uh, simple concepts on how Bitcoin hardware wallets work. Um, so we need to look at how Bitcoin hardware wallets derive addresses and the difference between a watch only wallet and like a full hardware wallet. You know, what keys are we including in that wallet? So we're going to take a little look at that now. As far as I can gather, the first type of Bitcoin wallet was called a non-deterministic Bitcoin wallet. And in that wallet, you would have private keys. And those private keys would be used to generate public keys. And those public keys could be used to generate Bitcoin addresses, which people could send Bitcoin to. Now, it's very important to note that these private keys aren't connected. And um, the private key is hashed to generate the public key and the public key is hashed to generate um, the address, the Bitcoin address for people to be able to send Bitcoins to. And these aren't connected at all. Now, so people can send uh, Bitcoin to you and your wallet can query the Bitcoin blockchain um, and it can look at what's called the UTXO. So the unspent transaction output for your addresses. It can retrieve that data and then display it in your wallet as a balance for you. OK, now it's very important to remember that with the UTXO, if you want to spend those uh, unspent, um, uh, th those Bitcoin, uh, so say we've got another address over here and we want to send in almost all of our Bitcoin minus a few Satoshis. We have to use all of the UTXO or all of the UTXOs um, to, 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 to send our funds. And we might have many, many addresses. We might have like hundreds of addresses um, to, uh, 
to this address here. Um, but we don't want to spend all of our funds. We want to spend, you know, just under all of our funds, which means that's why we have change addresses. So we can say that we want the change address to be this address here, and then that'll have a new input, which is um, uh, the change from that transaction. Okay. Um, so all of these private keys and all of the public keys, which they're connected to, and all of those Bitcoin addresses with all those UTXOs um, are not connected. Um, and the, the wallet has to concatenate those together when it wants to make a transaction and send that transaction to somebody. And then it more, most likely it generates a, a new address for you. Um, uh, so when it's, if there's any change in that transaction, then it can send that change back to you. And then it just displays in your wallet as, a, as an updated balance. In a deterministic wallet, you can use what's called a mnemonic phrase, so a collection of words, to generate a master private key. Now that master private key can be used to generate private keys, it can be hashed and used to generate private keys, and then those private keys, just as before, can generate the public keys, and those public keys, just as before, can be used to generate uh, Bitcoin addresses um, for you to uh, receive Bitcoin to. Okay, um, and just as before, it's all linear, it goes in one direction, the private key makes the public key, and the public key is hashed to make the addresses. Um, and then also we've got now we've got this master key, and this master key is hashed to create these private keys. Um, and uh, one of these private keys, you can't hash it backward just as before, you can't hash back to get your master private key. Uh, what this means is, um, for backing up, you can just keep your mnemonic phrase, um, and maybe a... Uh, an extra layer of security, like a, a passcode, um, and then that can be used to, to regenerate uh, your keys, your, your master private key, and then all of the other private keys attached. Whereas with the non-deterministic wallet, you would have to make regular backups of all of your keys. Uh, this is a lot easier to manage. And you can also, um, if you're there 12 or 24 words, then you can make the effort to remember those words, and then, um, then you, you have essentially a brain wallet, which is, um, which is pretty cool. Let's take a little look at BIF39. This is a standard which most Bitcoin wallets use, um, and in fact, a lot of wallets uh, other than Bitcoin for other types of uh, cryptocurrencies and altcoins, uh, use to generate that random mnemonic seed um, phrase, uh, which can be used to, to generate our, our, our private keys. Now, the most important thing to think of here now and um, kind of get our head around is something called entropy. Um, so entropy just means disorder, okay, chaos. Uh, we can use a random number generated to do this, um, or uh, we could, you know, randomly hit keys on a keyboard, um, uh, or, you know, uh, we could uh, take a photo and then hash through the photo and then try and get entropy that way. Uh, we just want as random uh, a number as, as, as possible. So if you imagine um, I've got two keys, like, you know, one and two, and then I just hit those two keys, and that's how I uh, I, 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 I build my uh, big long number which I'm going to use to generate my mnemonic seed. Uh, somebody could easily brute force that. They can dedicate some computer power to, to that and they could brute force it. So it's very important that we have as random a number as, 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 as possible. Okay, um, And then from that random number then we're able to um, we're able to get our, our mnemonic phrase. And then, you know, as before, we get our, our mnemonic phrase and that's used to make that pri uh, master private key. And then that master private key is used to make those private keys. Those private keys used to make the public keys and the public keys are used to make the Bitcoin addresses. And it all goes in, just as before, it all goes in um, in one direction. Um, okay. A really cool tool for describing how this works is one by Ian Coleman. Um, and this actually uses BIP39 and it shows you how uh, the entropy works and everything, so it's great. Um, so we're going to click on show entropy details here and I'm actually just going to randomly enter, enter a number. But I'm going to restrict, because I want low entropy just as an, to show you as an example, I'm going to restrict the, the keys I can hit to uh, just one and uh, two on the keypad, um, uh, as, I, as I said in my previous example. Now what it does is it takes all those ones and twos, okay, and then it makes a bunch of binary bits out of that number, out of that random number with incredibly low entropy, so incredibly low disorder. Um, uh, and it, used, it puts them into groups of 11 bits, um, and each one of those 11 bits uh, represents a word index, and that word index represents a word in the BIP39 uh, word list. So BIP39 has 2,048 words, 
um, and uh, these indexes references a word. So in that word list, you know, 374, number 374 is conduct. Um, so we can see that obviously that begins with C. So if we find, uh, you know, the next word, which is 1260, that begins with an O. So it you know, comes, obviously comes after C, which is outside. Um, so it's alphabetized a uh, 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 word index of, 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 rand, of, of words, um, which BIP39 uh, uses. Um, now, as I said, I've got incredibly low entropy, so it'd be very easy for a, c a computer to brute force the number I've used to generate my, um, my mnemonic uh, phrase, my mnemonic phrase. Um, so it's much better if I, you know, use all the keys on the keypad, um, but then um, all the numbers on the keypad. Uh, well, I think I've been pressing, yeah, I pressed hyphen a bunch of times, so it's discard the hyphen. It, it wants a number. Um, so here's the, here's the number which it's using. Uh, now that's a little bit more random. That's got better entropy. But as a human being, I you know I create patterns with my fingers, and all human beings create a similar pattern. So you can use that data to try and figure out the entropy, and then um, uh, and then uh, find out what my words are. Um, so the the more entropy, the better, and the more random and disorder, the better. And there's a whole bunch of different ways of, of approaching that that problem. Now, hopefully, with our uh, low entropy. Uh, list of words from the BIP39 word list, we can also add a passphrase. Um, and then using that passphrase and the crazy word list, um, we can generate an incredibly random uh, seed. Um, I think there's more combinations of seed uh, seeds to get to this particular seed than there are observable atoms in the universe. Some crazy, there's some crazy maths behind it like that. Um, so it's, it's a very, it's a very secure string of, of letters and numbers and people aren't, no one's going to brute force it. Using the low entropy and the new, which generated the mnemonic phrase, and then we used the mnemonic phrase in the passcode to generate the BIP39 crazy uh, random seed. Uh, the next part is deriving that master private key and then all our other keys, subsequent keys from there. Um, so uh, we're going to look at BIP, um, well, it's BIP32, 44, 49, 84, and 141. We're going to look specifically at BIP84 to generate that master private key. Um, which can then go on to generate those um, private keys, which can then go on to generate those public keys and um, those addresses as well. Taking that BIP39 seed, um, passing it to BIP84, it generates that extended private key, but ah, as well as that, it also generates a extended public key. And I'll show you why that's cool in a moment. So if we look at our extended private key, um, those uh, different private keys here, uh, which is generated and the subsequent public keys and then addresses which you can send funds to and have you know UTXOs attached to, um, uh, they're indexed, um, which we can see here. This is the indexing here. So as long as we're using the right indexing, we can generate an extended public key. And rather than having to use our extended private key to, um, to, to find the funds, uh, to find the right address or to generate a new address, we can use this extended public key um, and this extended public key will be able to retrieve the index of uh, a public key um, and the address, but it won't be able to retrieve the index of a private key. So we've got our um, master private key here, and we've got our uh, different uh, addresses which have been generated from these private keys. Uh, so if we say this is, this is one, and this is index two, and then this is index three here, um, now we want to generate a new uh, address for someone to send bitcoins to. Um, uh, before we would have to have used that that master private key to generate a, a private key and a public key and then generate the address. However, now we can generate that fourth um, uh, address using uh, that extended public key. Um, so instead of having to use our private key, we can use the extended public key to find the index for the public key and then the and then get the address and then people can send funds to that and we can keep generating new addresses for people to send funds to um, using our extended public key and we don't have to go anywhere near our extended private key um, which is much more secure if you just want you know new um, uh, addresses for people to send funds to. The reason this is relevant for us is because we are making a watch only wallet, not a full hardware wallet. We're working up to that. So we're going to use that extended public key to generate um, new addresses. So a real world application of this would be, you know, we have our Trezor, which is nice and secure. 
uh, buried deep um, in you know in that cave in that mountain somewhere. Um, um, if we want to generate a new address for someone to send Bitcoin to, we don't have to go and get our Trezor out and then generate the new address. We can just use this uh, watch-only hardware wallet. Right, so now we know all about BIP39 and 32, 44, 84, 141 and so on. Uh, we know how we derive addresses, how we generate seeds, all that sort of stuff. Um, you, you begin to appreciate how much work Stefan put into uh, building his uh, Arduino library, so well done to him. The EEP ROM library here, this is just a way for us to be able to save where we are um, in the address index. So we don't want to be generating the same addresses every time we plug our ASP32 in. We want us to generate new addresses. So it needs to remember where it last was or where it last generated addresses. Um, uh, yeah. So then we declare some variables. So these are our two buttons, which are we're using the, the touch pin functionality, the SP32. So you can actually have uh, literally just touch it with your finger and there's a, dro a dropping capacitance on, on, on the GPIO, which the SP32 can register. And we can say, well, if it drops below this capacitance, then, you know, do this thing. So essentially we can use those pins just as buttons without having to buy any buttons. We can just use, you know, wires, which is great. Um, we're setting the threshold, so we're saying when the capacitance drops under 20, then we want it to, to, to trigger the event. Um, and then there's a couple of integers here for the values, so we store the value, you know, what is the capacitance, blah, 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 is it under, you know. Okay, so here's our uh, public key, so this is where we need to include our, um, our public key. So um, when in uh, Trezor, if you're doing it through Trezor like me, uh, if you click on the actual um, the wallet, the wallet's name, and then if you click on show xpubs um, then it will give you uh, your xpub which you can copy um, and then paste into there we are into um, into arduino so now we've pasted that master public key in we're going to carry on um, so the next thing we do is we define a, a magic number okay so this is just um, a way of helping us detect whether we've written in the in the, the library before um, and then this is our index so we're setting the index to zero to begin with okay so we run the setup void sorry the setup, setup function um, so first thing we do is we activate the serial so that's so we can actually see the the data which is being output to the serial monitor then we check the EEP ROM to see if um, we've you know saved a different number here other than zero um, and if we have then we return it um, and then uh, there's a small delay of, of, of a tenth of a second and then we use the show address uh, function. So the show address function is down here. As I said, there's really not much code to go through. So this is the show address function here, everything we need. First thing it does is it um, generates an address. So we can see here, so this is using our public, our master public key and then it's generating the child, child, child address um, and this is using the index. So this is the index we set in the EP ROM. Um, and then it gets the address. Now this just prints out to serial the address uh, as a string. Uh, we also add this bit here so it makes it into one of those like Bitcoin URL things. Um, and then there's a nice bit of code here of Stepens which actually looks at the, the data, the address data and figures out how big our QR code needs to be which is pretty sweet. Next we use the QR code library um, and his uh, automatic QR size um, uh, thing here, bit of code here, to build our QR code. So we have a small gap um, between, you know, where we printed this bit out and the QR code. That's what that does. It's like, you know, enter, enter, enter. And then um, we print a little sort of gap um, on the edge on the left hand side. So it's not right up against the side of the monitor. Um, uh, and then we, um, yeah, we just go through line by line and draw out the QR code. So it goes and fetches the address and then it uses the QR code library to build the QR code. And that's about it really. So we show a QR code. Um, uh, so it's the one after the last QR code it would have shown the last time you turned it on. And then we run our loop. So in our loop, it just, um, it says, you know, is new, new address false? So do we need to update the address? Uh, if it is false, then um, yeah, we'll, we'll have a look in a second. So we've it, first thing it does because this is looping around again and again and again and again. So um, uh, it does it every you know tenth of a second. So if you touch one of those pins, so say if you touch the next pin, um, it saves that value. So say if the capacitance, the capacitance of the next pin is probably like you know 
60, 70, 70, 60, whatever. And then when you touch it, it drops down to about 10. Um, uh, uh, so when, once you, yeah, so you drop it, you touch it, it drop, drops down to about 10. So then it says, if uh, touch next value is under 20, which it is, it's 10, um, and uh, it's more than zero, um, so occasionally it drops to zero, so that was kind of like a bug, so this is just a way of avoiding that bug. Um, uh, then um, add uh, an extra one to the index, and then new address becomes true, okay? So, so say if it was at index four, so it's going to show address four in the, 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 the index of addresses, um, now it's going to, the index is going to be five. Um, and then the next bit of code here is just saying the same thing. It's saying if uh, the previous pins touched, then, um, you know, go back an address. So, so remove an address. So if that goes up to address index five, then, and shows, you know, uh, the fifth address in our index, then this will just take it back to index four. So it means you can scroll through the addresses forward and backwards. It's pretty cool. Um, uh, so here's the if. So if new, if new address, so if it's true, which it is, um, then uh, write to um, the EEP ROM, uh, the new index, and then show address. Uh, so it runs that show address function again, which we ran in the setup. Um, so it just goes and fetches the next address along or the, the address previous. Um, and that's pretty much it. And it just keeps looping around, waiting for you to touch those pins. And when you touch those pins, it generates the address you're asking it to, to generate. When we're putting the pins on the actual ESP32, uh, the pin we're going to be using for next, so when we press it, it will go next, that's pin uh, 4. And then the pin we're going to be using for previous, so when we look at the previous addresses it's generated, then that's pin 15. And that's it, there are two switches. And in order to switch it, all we need to do is just grab the end of that pin, and then the capacitance will drop, the SP32 will recognise the capacitance drop, and uh, it will just register it as a, as a trigger, you know, so like a switch. So that will go next for the next address, and that will go previous for the previous address. And we just need to touch them like that. Pretty cool. Right, so I'll upload it. I press the boot button to say I give it permission to upload. Starts uploading. There we are, cool. And that is UG. W2, if I press the blue one, oh, UGW2, if I go back, QHG, 7LU, EZW, so V6V, unplug it, close that, plug him in again, open the serial monitor, The reset. Da -dum, da -dum, da -dum. There we go. Cool. And this is 4GA. We want to find V6V. Is it that way? Nope. Or is it this way? Where's it gone? There we are. V6V. Nice. So uh, I think so. I unplugged it and plugged it in a couple of times. It generated a couple of extra addresses. But there's that old address. There we are, cool, and I can scroll through my old uh, addresses there. That's pretty cool. So I just plug it in, it gives me a new address, people can send Bitcoin to it, brilliant. So success, it works, we have a watch-only wallet, so if I want to generate a new address for my for someone to send funds to my Trezor, I don't need to take my Trezor out or use an old address, I can get this to generate a new address, um, and it's, uh, it's all on the hardware, it's not on a phone or some other device with lots of attack vectors, um, and I can also secure this and keep this safe. So brilliant, it works, fantastic. I'm gonna use it in the next tutorial. Um, and then we're gonna look into adding screens and some other functionality. So uh, until then, you know, thanks for watching and um, I'll see you again.